All right, guys, uh, <clears throat> let's start the action potential. We're going to get into details. So the next series of slides are all about these details of the action potential. What you want to focus on, I would say probably the most important items to focus on, are going to be the channels involved. Okay, so we'll be dealing with voltage-gated sodium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels, leak channels. Um, and what will be important is, is understanding the mechanics of the channels during each phase of the action potential. So you should know what each channel is doing during each phase. So for example, is, is the voltage-gated sodium channel open or closed? You should also know, based on that, what the flow of ions is going to be like. So what is the current? Okay, for example, is sodium uh, coming into the cell? Or is potassium leaving the cell? All right, so what you want to focus on is channel activity. Are the, are the channels opened or closed during each phase? What is ion flow like? What's sodium doing? Is it leaving? Is it coming in? All right, for example. Okay, so um, what I really like about the next series of slides is that that's exactly what is going to be compared. You will see a picture of a phase of the action potential along with a picture of what's going on with channels at that particular time. So I really recommend, um, you know, spending a good amount of time on those particular slides. I think those will be most useful for you in understanding how this action potential works. So uh, before I get into that, I, I, I'm going to try something here um, on the uh, whiteboard, if I can get to it. Let's see. Where's the whiteboard? Yeah, okay, so let me try this. So what I want to do to start off here is just give a summary of what the channels are. All right, so let's just do that first. So I'm gonna type in here, and I don't think you'll be able to see what I have typed onto this whiteboard until I'm finished typing it. Okay, so uh, first we will have, so I'm just going to sort of talk to you while I'm writing this, and, and like I said, you should see it after I'm finished typing it. Okay, so, so what we're doing here is, well, I'm going to list for you the channels involved and kind of what's going on with them. Okay, so first of all, you will have a voltage-gated sodium channel. And you should understand, first of all, this sodium channel is going to open or close based on changes in voltage, right? That's why it's called a voltage-gated sodium channel. All right, so that's the first most important thing to understand about this channel. The second thing is which way is sodium going? So when this channel opens, you're going to have sodium influx. It's really important that you understand the terms influx and efflux because that is the terminology that will be used on the quiz and exam. So when we say influx, it means entry, okay? This means sodium is entering the cell, okay? So that's one thing, uh, or one uh, cell type. Why is this doing this? Okay. So the next important one is the... voltage-gated potassium channel, all right? So uh, similar to the sodium channel, this channel will open in response to some kind of change in voltage. And of course, it's specific for potassium flux. And in this case, what we're having, instead of influx with the voltage-gated potassium channel, is we're having potassium efflux in this case. 
right? So this means potassium, when this voltage-gated potassium channel opens in response to a change in voltage, that the potassium is going to exit the cell. It's going to leave the neuron, okay? Uh, another thing I want to note, if I can get back to this. Uh, it's not going to let me. Okay. All right, what else do we have here? We have leak channels. Okay, now leak channels are of two kind, kinds. You can have sodium leak channels. And you should know that there are a decreased number of these. You don't have very many sodium leak channels. I think I mentioned that before. Second type of channel here, leak channel, is going to be the potassium leak channel. And you should know that there are an increased number of these. And so, so because there are an increased number of potassium leak channels, this means that the neuron membrane is more permeable to potassium than it is to sodium. Now, understand that through the potassium leak channel, we're having potassium efflux. Now, the so I don't know if I can get back up here to this sodium channel. The sodium leak channel is going to be associated with sodium influx. All right. Um, last thing I want to mention here is not a channel but a pump, and you all have heard of this. It's called the sodium-potassium pump. You should know that the sodium-potassium pump is going to maintain resting membrane potential. All right, so these are really the, the main players here. I'm hoping that uh, you can all see this. So the main players are, first, we have a voltage-gated sodium channel. And this is going to be associated with sodium influx. And let's see if I can mention here that you should know that the voltage-gated sodium channel is pretty, pretty fast. All right, it's pretty, it's pretty fast to open and close. Whereas the voltage-gated potassium channel is slow. Uh, so just to summarize here again, we have voltage-gated sodium channels. When these open or close, it's going to be associated with sodium influx. And these sodium channels, compared to their counterpart of the voltage-gated potassium channel, are pretty fast to open or close. All right, we have a voltage-gated potassium channel, and that's going to be associated with potassium efflux. And this potassium channel is slow. All right, it's slow to open and it's slow to close, which is going to explain a couple of things about the action potential, okay? So that will, that information will come in handy. Um, now, let me add something else. I know I'm sort of dwelling on this a little bit, but I, I wanna make sure y'all understand. So um, also associated with the voltage-gated sodium channel and sodium influx, well, we associate this with depolarization. Voltage-gated sodium channel and the sodium influx is associated with depolarization. The voltage-gated potassium channel and potassium efflux is associated with repolarization. Okay, now we have our leak channels. Remember that leak channels are always open. They're always open. Okay, so they don't have any gates. Leak channel, we have a sodium leak channel, we have a potassium leak channel. Sodium leak channel, there are fewer, fewer of these on the neuronal membrane compared to the potassium leak channel. Okay, so really the sodium leak channel, um, you know, we really don't deal with that a whole lot actually in the action potential. It, there, 
the activity associated with this channel is really not that significant in the action potential. But you should know about it. You should know that there is that, that these do exist and that it's going to be associated with sodium influx. Now, potassium leak channel, we have a lot of these. And so this is going to be associated with potassium efflux. And one more thing I'm just going to try to write in here. Associated with the potassium leak channel, you want to associate this with repolarization. Okay. So when we're having repolarization occur, it's caused by potassium efflux through potassium leak channels. This is one of the main uh, factors that's going to cause repolarization. Remember that repolarization is the effort of the neuron to come back to rest, to come back to a resting state. Remember that negative 70 millivolts, okay? So we're trying to bring the cell back to that. As far as the sodium potassium pump, well, remember how this works, that we're going to have three sodium pumped out of the neuron per every potassium pumped back in. And this potassium, uh, sodium potassium pump is really important in not really bringing the cell back to rest. So not so much of a role in repolarization, but once we do reach rest, it will help maintain that resting state. Okay, so definitely be aware of these uh, uh, channels, what ions are involved, which way the ions are going, and uh, some other facts about them. All right, let me try and get back to the PowerPoint. Oh, I have to stop sharing that first. All right, so let's see. I believe we were on slide 20 something. Why is this large? Uh, okay, let's see. Maybe it's better to have this large. All right. Let me see if I can make this not zoom. No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Little uh, user difficulties there, user error on my part. Okay, let's get back to this. So, action potential. All right. Uh, I did mention graded potentials last time and how, in comparison, uh, graded potentials are going to be short distance communication and action potentials are going to be long distance. All right. So, we'll be able to transmit messages over a long distance. Uh, by using these action potentials. Remember that this only occurs in muscle cells and neurons. Action potentials, unlike graded potentials, do not decay. All right, they do not decay or fade out over time. And remember what's going on here. Remember that a receiving neuron at the dendrites is going to receive some electrical signal, and that electrical signal will be in the form of graded potentials. And those short distance traveling signals will just sort of emanate through the dendrites to the cell body. And remember, they're going to die out if the, single, if the signals aren't strong enough. But if the signals are strong enough, and, and that, well, what that means is, are there a lot of graded potentials? If you have a lot of graded potentials that summate or add up at the soma, then that will cause an action potential to develop at the axon hillock. Once that action potential uh, is developed there, it will just continue to go down the entire length of the axon. It does not stop. Okay, so remember that action pot potentials are actually preceded by graded potentials. You have a bunch of graded potentials acting over the short distance of dendrite to soma, 
and those all add up and that is actually going to uh, lead to an action potential. Uh, you know, different words for the action. Action potential is the best term to use for this uh, event. Your book and a lot of other resources call it a nerve impulse. Um, you know, and I guess that's okay, but really technically it's not okay because what's a nerve? A nerve is a collection of axons. All right. So when we look at action potentials, we look at how they occur down individual axons. So anyway, whatever. Just so you know, sometimes it's called a nerve impulse. Uh, blurry slide again, uh, but we can get through it. So action potential is very fast. All right. It's very fast. It's dependent on membrane voltage. We will have uh, the movement of ions. All right. We call that current through the dendrites, through the receiving part of the neuron, and all those little graded potentials are gonna collect, they're gonna summate, and um, if, it's, if there are enough of them that add up, that it causes an, enough of a uh, change in voltage, then at the axon hillock, we will begin the action potential. Now, depolarization, remember this is depolarization happening here at the level of the dendrites and within the soma, you're having depolarization, so that means we're having sodium influx. Now, the thing is, is that we will not be able to start an action potential unless that millivoltage inside of that soma reaches negative 55. That is definitely a number you should know. Okay, this is considered threshold. So in order to start a full-blown action potential, that negative 70 at rest must reach negative 55. That means we must have enough sodium ions coming in to raise that millivoltage from negative 70 to negative 55. If we reach negative 55 in there, then we will have an action potential occur. If it does not reach a negative 55, we will not have an action potential take place. Now, negative 55 is a pretty standard number. Um, you, uh, on a quiz or exam, I may say it as uh, negative 55 to negative 50, somewhere in that range, because threshold can vary a little bit uh, based on the neuron, based on what kind of neuron it is, where it is, what it does, all right, but, but a pretty standard number, uh, a pretty standard range is going to be between negative 55 and negative 50 millivolts, all right, so definitely want to know that, all right, um, and this is really hard to see down here, but basically what it's saying is, you know, um, you know, once we have this negative 55 reached, we're going to continue to have the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels all along, Okay, it's like a domino effect, all right? Once we get this negative 55, we're going to open, open, open all along the membrane, all down the length of the axon. We're going to see the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels so that we can continue to have sodium influx occurring all throughout the length of the axon so that that action potential does not die out, all right? Um, we need to continue to have sodium influx going in there in order to, um, you know, keep that action potential going down the whole length of the axon. So it's basically like a positive feedback situation here. It's a positive feedback. Remember, positive feedback, we're going to have an increase, increase, increase in something until some final physiologically important goal is achieved. And in this case, it is the completion of an action potential um, uh, down the entire length of the axon uh, so that it can arrive at the synapse to cause some sort of change happen in the synapse. All right, so here we get into it. So we're gonna talk about this voltage-gated sodium channel here in more detail. Now, rather than read these words to you, I think it would be better if I jump ahead a little here and show you the configuration of the voltage-gated sodium channel. This is really important. I'm so sure you'll have a question about this. Um, you know, and the reason this is important is because uh, the configuration of the voltage-gated sodium channel is very important, uh, not only, you know, just in understanding the action potential, but also in, uh, in the clinical world, uh, there are plenty of drugs that are designed to manipulate 
specific parts of the sodium of this voltage gated sodium channel to have a desired effect. Uh, you might talk about these uh, in 139, all right, next semester. When you take that class, probably, you know, you may revisit this uh, and how, you know, some of these drugs, like in the heart, for example, um, or with blood pressure, for example, and, and other diseases are actually uh, specifically manipulating parts of um, uh, this, this voltage-gated sodium channel. Um, one, uh, cocaine, for example, cocaine actually does affect specific parts of this sodium channel. All right, so let's look at how this voltage-gated sodium channel is structured. Let's look at that. All right, so on the left here, we have, now first of all, the voltage-gated sodium channel has two gates on it, two gates. One of these gates is called the activation gate. Now look at this activation gate. The activation gate you can see is sort of like flanking the outside of the sodium channel on both sides. Okay, So this outer little structure here that's on the lateral aspect of this channel, this is part of the activation gate. Now notice that the activation gate actually continues within the channel. It continues to the very middle, to the opening. Okay, so the activation gate goes from out here through the channel all the way to the inside, all the way to the opening. So I hope you all can see how that is. Okay, now there is a second gate on this channel inactivation gate. The inactivation gate has a totally different structure. It has like a ball and chain type structure. This is called the inactivation gate. Okay, so let's look at how these di two different gates are situated during different times. So this one on the left here is showing you at rest. Okay, so this is the configuration of the voltage-gated sodium channel when the neuron is at rest. Okay, so we're at negative 70 millivolts inside here. At rest, notice how these uh, gates look. Now, when you're trying to answer a question about this on a quiz or exam, I think it's really helpful to try to envision this particular channel. Envision, like, how it is. What are the gates like? during each time. Have a, an image in your mind about how they look. Okay, so how do they look? Well, during rest, the activation gate is considered closed. You should know this. During rest, the activation gate is closed. And you can see that. Look here in the middle. Okay, the activation gate is closed. So in that case, we're not able to bring sodium in. We're not going to have sodium influx if the cell is at rest because the activation gate is closed. All right, uh, and I'll notice here that the inactivation gate, how it is, it's just sort of hanging out here. It's just sort of hanging out. Now, the, the proper terminology to use for this during rest, the inactivation gate is open. It is open. Now, you can kind of think like, okay, the activation gate, it's called activation gate because it will activate the flow of sodium through. The inactivation gate is called inactivation because at the end of the action potential, at the end, well, I'm sorry, at the end of depolarization, Okay, at the end of depolarization, when we're going to start to bring that cell to rest, the inactivation gate inactivates the flow of sodium. Okay, so let's just, again, take it step by step here. Resting state, you should definitely know the configuration of this voltage-gated sodium channel. Activation gate is closed because we're at rest. Inactivation gate is open. 
it's open because we don't have anything to inactivate right now. Okay, so it's just open. It doesn't need to do anything right now. Next, what does depolarization look like with this channel? Notice that the activation gates have risen upward. Notice how they've sort of lifted upward to actually touch uh, this channel, the side of the channel here. Notice that when that happens, what is going to happen to the inner part of the activation gate? Okay, when this lateral aspect of the activation gate rises upward, it causes the inner part of itself to sort of move within the channel so that this opening is clear. Okay, so in this case, during depolarization, we're having now we can have sodium influx. Because now the activation gate is considered open. Okay, the activation gate in this configuration is considered open. Notice that the inactivation gate is still open. All right, so your configuration here of the voltage gated sodium channel during depolarization is that both activation gate and inactivation gate are open. Next, look here. Okay, so the third image is showing you repolarization. Okay, this is representing repolarization. Basically, the inside of this cell has reached the peak amount of sodium ions that can come in there. It's reached the peak of, of uh, the action potential. So at that point, we're going to start to see that the voltage-gated gated, uh, sodium channel will then start to inactivate. At this point, we want to stop any more sodium influx. So we're going to do that by having it move upwards and plug this channel. It's going to basically plug the channel to prevent any further sodium influx. Now, notice the activation gate is still open. Okay, and the reason for this is because the activation gate is a little bit slower to these these lateral parts of the of the activation gate are a little bit slower to move back downwards to its resting state as shown in this first picture. Uh, you know uh, the mechanics of that have been studied, and it's really uh, a, a lot based on just the fact that these um, activation gates. The, are actually heavier. They're, they're just, they have a higher molecular weight. So it takes a little bit longer for the activation gate to close. Okay. So that's why it's important that we have this inactivation gate. Okay. It's going to be a little easier for this inactivation gate to just go and plug, uh, plug that hole. Okay. Plug that channel so no more sodium comes in. So during repolarization, what is the configuration of this sodium channel? Well, the activation gates are slower to close. So this means activation gates are still open. During repolarization, activation gates are still open. But now we have here, our inactivation gate is considered closed. It's closed because it's closing off this channel. All right, so there is your voltage-gated sodium channel. You should know the activation gates, the inactivation gates. What's going on? Are they closed, open, at what times? All right, during rest, what are they like? During depolarization, what are they like? During repolarization, what are they like? And I'm just going to go back to the slide here with the words describing everything. I So at resting state, right, um, all... Get all voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels are going to be closed because there is no change in voltage, right? And remember that these voltage-gated uh, channels only open or close based on a change in voltage. They're not going to open unless there's a change in voltage. So, of course, during rest, all of your voltage-gated channels are closed. The only um, sodium and potassium channels we have open are going to be the leak channels. Remember, leak channels are always open. And so leak channels are going to help maintain resting membrane potential. Now, the potassium leak channel will help return the cell to resting membrane potential. 
Remember your sodium gates. Activation gates, they're closed at rest, open at depolarization. All right, obviously during depolarization, both gates are going to be open, both. All right, and this is how we get sodium influx. All right, so activation gate, remember, uh, it's going to open first. It's going to open before the inactivation gate because we really don't need activity of the inactivation gate at that point. But remember, activation gates are slower to close, which is why we need that inactivation gate. Inactivation gates are open at rest. All right, and they're also going to be open at depolarization. The only time they're going to be closed is during repolarization in order to prevent any more sodium from coming in. All right, so that's your sodium channel. Now, fortunately for you and everybody else who studies the action potential, what about the voltage-gated potassium channel? The voltage-gated potassium channel is much easier to understand because it does not have two gates, all right? It only has one gate, and it's very simple. It's just going to open or close at different times, all right? At rest, it's closed. A okay, voltage-gated potassium channel is closed at rest, of course. Nothing's going on at rest. Voltage, no voltage-gated channel needs to open at rest. And then once we start to depolarize, so once we're having sodium influx through these uh, voltage-gated sodium channels, you will slowly start to see that the pota voltage-gated potassium channel will open. And remember I mentioned that Sodium channels are quick. Uh, Voltage-gated potassium channels are slower. Okay, so during depolarization, they start to open very slowly. Now, they will also close very slowly, and you'll see why that's important. All right, um, so this uh, picture on the left here is the same one that I already showed you. All right, same one showing you uh, the activity of the voltage-gated sodium channel at different phases. Now look over here to the right, and here we're seeing the activity of the voltage-gated potassium channel. Again, this one's much easier to understand because it only has one gate. Okay. Notice here it has a gate, like an activation gate, just like this uh, voltage-gated sodium channel. Okay. So at rest, right, which is here on the left, at rest, we are not the, uh, the voltage-gated potassium channel is closed. It's closed. Remember which direction our ions are going. Remember that for the voltage-gated sodium channel, we're having sodium influx. For the voltage-gated potassium channel, we're going to see potassium efflux. So depolarization will trigger, okay, will start to trigger the voltage-gated potassium channel to start to open, okay? But it does so slowly because remember these types of gates here? You know, they're, they're pretty heavy, so they're a little bit slower to move, all right? So in the case of this uh, voltage-gated potassium channel, we're going to have slow opening, all right? Remember, we don't have it, uh, this ball and chain structure over here on the potassium channel, all right? So it's going to be slow to close as well. Because remember, these uh, gates that flank the side of the channel are, are heavier, so they're slower. All right, so at repolarization, this is what you're looking at with this voltage-gated potassium channel. We're having potassium efflux. Why are we having potassium efflux at repolarization? Remember, because remember we had all this positively charged sodium coming into the cell during depolarization. And what that did was it made that negative 70 millivolts more positive, more and more and more positive. We went from negative 70 millivolts to the threshold of negative 55 millivolts. And guess what? We're going to reach a peak of about 30, positive 35 millivolts. All right. Now, so at some point, okay, at the peak of depolarization, you see that the inside of the cell has a positive millivoltage. So here at repolarization, in order to bring the cell back to rest, back to negative, we need to get rid of positive charge. So that's why at depolarization, I'm sorry, at repolarization, we're going to see the stoppage of sodium influx. There won't be any more positive charge coming in. And now we need there to be positive charge leaving 
So that will be attached to potassium. Potassium will help restore the neuron back to resting state during repolarization. That's again your close-up view of that uh, sodium channel. All right, and here's where, you know, I, I really like uh, how the next series of slides goes because you're going to be able to compare channel activity, ion flow, with a specific phase of the action potential. Okay, so let me just jump ahead real quick, and then I'm going to go through all this. All I want to do is go find this one picture yeah okay so here is uh the action potential uh on a graph all right this you want to know like the back of your hand all right you want to know like the back of your hand all right so let's just go through it negative seven we have millivolts here we have time at the bottom so negative 70 millivolts, this is resting. This is resting membrane potential. Now, let's say we have a local potential start to occur, meaning we have a whole bunch of graded potentials. Remember that graded potentials last over a local or a short distance. So we're going to have a whole bunch of graded potentials coming in through, these, through the dendrites and the soma. And if we have enough of them to reach negative 55, remember that's threshold, if we have enough graded potentials to cause the inside of that cell due to sodium influx, go from a negative 70 to a negative 55, then we take off. Then we have an action potential take off and the inside of that cell will just continue to become more and more positive. And we're gonna reach a peak of about positive 35. That is another number that you definitely need to know. So negative, I'm sorry, positive 35. Now, it might be positive 30 in some cells, all right? It might be, but uh, positive 35 is a pretty good standard number to go with. Right. So once we peak, uh, reach the peak, okay, we're having depolarization happening here that's bringing us to a peak millivoltage of positive 35. Remember, depolarization is characterized by sodium influx. All this positive charge is coming in. All right, and then once we reach that positive 35, it is now that we start to see the result of the voltage-gated potassium channel opening. Now, we're gonna see that, well, first of all, voltage-gated sodium channels are closed at this point. Up here at the peak, we have closed the voltage-gated sodium channels. And now we have our voltage-gated potassium channels open, and that is going to cause us to be able to come back down to reach the resting stage. This is characterized by potassium efflux. Okay, now I want you to note something down here. Notice that as we, we're going through repolarization, we're coming back down to, to rest. For a very brief period of time, you can see that this line, okay, the millivoltage, goes down just a little bit more negative than negative 70. It's gonna dip down just slightly. You should know that this value corresponds actually with negative 90. Negative, it's about negative 90 down here. We're gonna go just for a brief period of time to an even lower millivoltage, an even more negative millivoltage than rest. You should know this is called hyperpolarization. Now, what is the cause of this? Remember that I mentioned that voltage-gated potassium channels are slower. They're slow to open, which is what allows this depolarization to reach this level. They're slow to close as well. So what we're seeing is we're seeing just a little bit more potassium efflux occurring here because that voltage-gated potassium channel is just slow to close. But eventually, it closes, and then we level off here at negative 70. So again, you really want to know all these numbers involved. You want to know what 
that depolarization uh, looks like a rise in this line. Repolarization is a decline in this line. Hyperpolarization, we're going lower than negative 70. You want to know what's going on with all the channels during all these phases and which way um, are the ions flowing. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and match this up with the channel activity. Okay. All right. Here is your action potential up here. Here we have resting state. At the resting state, we'll look at our voltage-gated channels. Voltage-gated sodium channel, activation gate is closed. Inactivation gate is open. Voltage-gated potassium channel, the gate is closed. So right, during rest, we're not having any flow. We're not having any sodium current. We're not having any potassium current through voltage-gated uh, voltage channels. Now, at depolarization, let's look at the picture. So here is depolarization. At depolarization, voltage-gated sodium channel activation gates are now open. Inactivation gate is also open. Remember, both gates are open. That is the only way that we can have sodium influx. Now remember, our voltage-gated potassium channel is slower compared to the so voltage-gated sodium channel, so it's slower to open. It's not open quite yet here. Again, this is part of what's going to allow this, this depolarization because it, it doesn't uh, allow for any counteracting potassium efflux when all we're having all this sodium influx. Okay, So you should know configuration of these channels during depolarization. And actually, let me just go back a slide and make sure I mentioned everything about depolarization. Right, so, um, right, sodium influx. And I did mention that, um, right, and you know, we're trying to get to a negative 55, really the range is negative 55 to negative 50. Uh, it's a positive feedback mechanism. Once we reach that threshold, it's a positive feedback mechanism that's going to cause the opening of all voltage-gated sodium channels all along the whole length of the axon. We will reach up to about positive 30 or positive 35 millivolts for the peak of the uh, depolarization. So once we reach that, okay, we're going to then see repolarization occurring. Now, um, during repolarization, our, our sodium, voltage-gated sodium channels are starting the process of inactivation. Remember that the activation gate is not quite closed yet. It's a little bit slower to move. So that's why we really need this inactivation gate to do what it does and go uh, upward and plug that channel to stop any more sodium influx. Now, also keep in mind, and you can sort of imagine this in your mind, that um, you know, this inactivation gate closes before the activation gates close. And so once this uh, ball and chain type structure enters the channel, the opening, it's actually going to push on uh, the inner parts of the activation gate. It's going to sort of push on them. And that's going to cause, just by basic mechanics here, it's going to cause the activation gates to come downward, uh, back downward into their closed state. So once these activation gates then are pushed downward, okay, part, uh, you know, partly due to the activity of this inactivation gate, <coughs> then the inactivation gate will fall downwards. <coughs> All right, so repolarization. Finally, our voltage-gated potassium channel has fully opened and now we are able to see potassium efflux and a return back to a negative millivoltage. Let me go back and make sure I mentioned everything I want to say on repolarization. Right, sodium channels are in the process of inactivating. Potassium channels open. Okay, remember the configuration of your sodium channel here at repolarization. All right, sodium channel inactivation gates close. All right, that little ball and chain structure is going to close, meaning it's going to plug the channel. 
Um, but our activation gates are, are still a little bit slower to close, so they're still open. All right, uh, voltage gated potassium channels are open, and we're now seeing potassium efflux. And uh, this process of repolarization. Now, after repolarization, remember, it's going to be the sodium potassium pumps, okay, that are actually going to, they play, they do play a minor role in repolarization. Their main role is maintaining rest, which is different. All right, so hyperpolarization. Remember I mentioned hyperpolarization. Um, uh, now, during hyperpolarization, you see the voltage-gated sodium channel back in its completely rested state. Okay, now keep something in mind here. In order for us to have, a, let's say we want to have a second action potential. Let's say we're going to have an act, another action potential take place right after this one. In order for that to happen, the sodium channel has to return to its fully resting state. It has to return to its fully resting state if it's going to be activated again. All right. So this whole process here is necessary. So at hyperpolarization, we finally see that our voltage-gated sodium channel is back in its resting state, meaning the activation gates are closed and the inactivation gate is open. And remember that hyperpolarization is really marked by uh, this, uh, for a very brief period of time, an increase in potassium efflux, uh, even beyond the negative 70 millivoltage, because our uh, gates on this potassium channel are slow to close. Just like they're slow to open, they're slow to close too. Uh, let me make sure I mentioned everything about hyperpolarization. Right, we still have some potassium channels open, right, at hyperpolarization. Now, at this point, remember, sodium channels are completely reset at this point. Repolarization, which happens before hyperpolarization, our, so our voltage-gated sodium channels are not completely reset. So that means during repolarization, you cannot have another action potential in that same neuron. You have to reach... Um, you know, get to hyperpolarization and beyond before you can have another action potential begin in that same neuron because you have to have these sodium channels go back to their completely fully rested state. Okay, remember, hyperpolarization is marked by the success of potassium efflux due to the slow closing of those channels. Okay, I mentioned all of it. Here is, again, the summary of all this. Remember, um, one of the most important things to study, I think, in this whole lecture really is this, this deal of, you know, having this knowledge of what's going on with, the, with each of these uh, voltage-gated channels. How does that dictate ion flow? All right. Which way, is, uh, uh, which way are the ions going? Is it influx or reflux? And how does that match up with the different levels, the different phases of the action potential as seen on the graph? All right. Um, this is just another image, all right, of the same thing that I showed you before. Okay. This is from your textbook. All right. And again, it's showing you the activities. If you just want to look at it a different way, here it is a different way but it's the same story. Okay, um, again, just a picture of the action potential. But um, now, uh, the reason I included this slide was just to show you that, well, like on the left here, when we're looking at this action potential, we sort of space it out and spread it out uh, just so it, it, it's easier to explain, so it's easier to learn, so it's easier to identify each phase. So we sort of spread it out. But in real life, all right, if you're looking at, like, let's say an EEG, an electroencephalogram, for example, like you've got electrodes um, on somebody's head, for example, and, you know, you're measuring, like, uh, electrical activity. You're measuring action potentials. This is what the action potential will look like in real life. That's how it's going to come up, okay? Again, we just sort of widen it out, uh, make it a little bigger here, 
uh, for teaching purposes and learning purposes. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, not really a big, big deal here. Uh, just showing you um, our, our millivoltage and our action potential and how this is going to look in an axon. All right. Okay, so at rest, all right, uh, we have not had uh, the opening of uh, voltage, enough opening of voltage gated sodium channels at this point. Basically, what this is showing you is like here are before this some graded potentials that are starting to accumulate. And so you're starting to see the entry of sodium shown as these positive charges into the axon. Okay, but we're going to need to have that continue to happen up to negative 55 in order to cause all the rest of the sodium channels on this axon to open up. Okay, so this is at rest what we're seeing. All right, then we have our uh, depolarization event. Okay, this is where we have been, we have had enough graded potentials take place to cause an action potential. And this is going to have like a domino effect all the way down the length of the axon, causing open, 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 voltage gated sodium channels, open, 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 all along the length of the axon, bringing in positive charges from sodium, causing the inside of that cell, inside of that axon to become more positive. And then we reach our peak of positive 30 to positive 35 millivolts. Okay, and then here we're going to see that um, once we reach our peak, all right, then we're going to have our sodium channels closed, our voltage-gated potassium channels open, and we're having positive charge leave. Now it says here, not all depolarization events produce action potentials. Well, yes, that's true because, well, when you think of a graded potential, what is a graded potential? Well, it also involves the influx of sodium, but we need a lot of influx of sodium in action potential. Remember that we have to reach threshold, all right, to cause an action potential. And now once we get our action potential, it goes by what's called the all or none law. This simply means that the action potential, if threshold is reached, it will go. It will fire, and that's it. You can't stop it. Okay. Once it reaches negative 55, it takes off, and it, it, it doesn't stop until it reaches the end of the axon. All or none. It's going to go all the way, or it's not going to happen at all. All right. Um, this is all just a little bit repetitive here. At threshold, you know, we have negative 55 to negative 50 millivolts. At this point, sodium permeability increases. And what does that mean? It just simply means that we're having the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels, that more and more at this point, at threshold, we start to see the opening of more and more uh, voltage-gated sodium channels all along the length of the axon in a positive feedback fashion. Now, we are having, remember that um, we are having potassium efflux through other channels. Remember the potassium leak channel? The potassium leak channel is always open, and it's always sending out potassium. It's always sending potassium out. But once we reach this negative 55, then we're going to see that the massive amount of sodium influx is going to counteract any positive efflux that might be going through those leak channels. Okay, so sodium influx at depolarization totally uh, exceeds or outweighs pota any potassium efflux that might be happening. All right, so again, that's another reason we're going to have a positive millivoltage reached. So I kind of hinted at this earlier, uh, something called refractory periods. There are actually two types of refractory periods. And what is a refractory period? It is referring to a time frame during the action potential in which you cannot get another action potential. You can't get a second one, okay? 
And the reason for this is, well, it's going to be based, obviously, on the configuration of the voltage-gated uh, channels. Specifically, it's going to be based on the voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, so again, there are two types of refractory periods during which you cannot get a second action potential. All right, and remember, this is mainly due to the fact that in order to get a second action potential, you have to have all of your voltage-gated sodium channels completely reset to their resting position or else they cannot respond to a second stimulus. All right, so two types. You have an absolute refractory period. Absolute means you absolutely cannot get another action potential during this time. Okay, this is because our voltage-gated sodium channels are not reset. No stimulus of any strength can trigger a second action potential during this time. Okay, and this will last as long as it takes for the voltage-gated sodium channels to reset. Um, you know, why do we have this? Well, it does ensure that the action potential goes, that the first action potential goes the whole length of the axon, right? If you have a second one come along before the first one is completed, well, the first one may not complete, all right? So this helps uh, ensure that we have this um, all or none situation. It also ensures one-way transmission. So the second type of refractory period is called the relative refractory period. Now, this is going to be following the absolute refractory period. During uh, this relative, it's like it's relative. Whether or not we get another action potential at this time is relative to the number of sodium channels that have reset. And it must be the majority. The majority of vo 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 uh, voltage-gated sodium channels must be reset. Now, at this point, you do still have some, uh, some uh, voltage-gated potassium channels still open. But again, that's just because they're slow to close. Okay, but it's, you can get <coughs> another action potential at this point just, just following the absolute refractory period if we have enough of our voltage-gated sodium channels reset. So you should know this generally lasts until um, hyperpolarization ends. We're still having a little bit of repolarization happening there. Now, with a relative refractory period, you must have, uh, and it must be an exceptionally strong stimulus that, that uh, is able to be active here. And this is a pretty good picture here. I like this because, um, you know, it does uh, show you like what parts of the action potential these these uh, periods are in. And I had a second picture here. All right. Um, so the absolute refractory period is the gray shaded region. The absolute refractory period, you absolutely cannot have another action potential because either we're having depolarization still occurring in the previous action potential, as well as are our, um, you know, voltage-gated sodium channels reset yet? Now, definitely during, like, probably the mid part of repolarization, you do not have voltage-gated sodium channels reset to the resting position yet, okay? So this is absolutely not, can you get another action potential here? Now, the relative refractory period is in this darker blue here. And as you can see, it's just after the absolute refractory period. So depending on the strength of the second action potential, or let me rephrase that, depending on the strength or the number of graded potentials that are coming at this neuron at this time, that will dictate, as well as in conjunction, how many voltage-gated sodium channels are back to their resting state. Okay, those two things together will dictate whether or not we get a second action potential during this time. So that would be during the process of repolarization and hyperpolarization. So you should have an idea on when those periods take place. All righty. Action potentials in terms of velocity. Well, first of all, they only occur, action potentials only happen in axons and okay, not other parts of the neuron. So it's really around the axon 
um, that we devote attention to understanding conduction velocity. All right, so conduction, we're talking about how quickly is this action potential propagated in the axon. <coughs> so you should know that um, the rate or the velocity of an action potential really is going to depend on two things. One uh, factor that affects this is going to be the diameter of the axon. Okay, how large, how wide is it? Larger diameter axons have less resistance. Okay, so they're going to be associated with a faster action potential, faster conduction. Secondly, what will dictate the rate of conduction is going to be the degree of myelination. All right, so remember myelin, right? Myelin is a fatty based substance, lipid based substance that is surrounding axons. Now, not all axons are myelinated. Some are myelinated, some are not. All right, so, but if it does have myelin, right, this myelin, myelin is a resistor. So it's actually going to help increase conduction, but this is associated with another structure that I have on the next slide. So we need to understand that. Okay, so, so first of all, understand. If you have myelinated a myelinated neuron, you're going to see a faster action potential conduction in that. And that initially might not make sense to you because you might be thinking, well, if myelin is a resistor, that means you're not having current, right? You're not having ion flow through a resistor. That's true. Okay. Uh, in myelinated neurons, we have uh, the type of conduction is called saltatory conduction, saltatory, saltatory, coming from the idea that there are sodium channels. This is going to make more sense when we go over the next couple slides here, I hope. Now, you also have situations where you can have neurons that are not myelinated, and these neurons uh, follow continuous conduction. All right, this just means that. Okay, saltatory conduction means that the action potential is jumping. It's jumping. It's going to jump from one node of Ron VA to the next node of Ron VA to the next node of Ron VA. And I'll clarify that again here in a few. Continuous conduction, that means we're not having this jumping action of the action potential. We're having just a continuous flow of that signal down the neuron. And this would be seen in unmyelinated neurons. Okay, but continuous conduction is going to be slower. It's going to be slower because the presence of myelin increases the speed of the action potential. All right, and we will see a couple of pictures here where that should make sense. Okay, so remember, continuous conduction is slow. It's a slow action potential in non-myelinated axons. Saltatory conduction is the type of action potential conduction that is seen in myelinated axons. And it is fast. It's much faster than continuous conduction. Now, here's the deal. Myelin sheath, it's lipid-based, so it insulates. Now, also, due to the fact that it's lipid-based, it's this thick sheath around the axon. Here's the deal. Wherever there is myelin, there are no voltage-gated sodium channels. You do not have sodium channels where there is myelin. So it's in this way, <laughs> partly in this way, that the myelin sheath does serve as a resistor in the sense that it is not going to allow exit of sodium, is it? If there are no sodium channels in myelin, there's no way for sodium to get in and out of the axon wherever there is myelin. Hopefully that makes sense a little bit, all right? There are, I'm gonna say it again. There are no sodium channels wherever there's myelin. You just can't fit sodium channels there because there's all this myelin, okay? So this is how the myelin sheath serves as a resistor, okay? It, it, it is not going to allow current. It resists 
the flow of ions because, well, there are no ion channels there. This also is going to help us to preserve those ions that came in in other areas that are not myelinated. Okay, so just like the myelin sheath does not allow entry of sodium, we don't uh, get the exit of sodium either. So we're so the myelin is helping to conduct the action potential by keeping those charges inside of the axon from leaving. Okay, so it prevents leakage of charge. Now, well, how does sodium get in then, right? How does sodium get in if we don't have it uh, sodium channels in the myelin sheath? This is due to this very important structure or lack of structure called the nodes of Ranvier. Remember that myelin sheath is in sections. It's in sections. And so there are these little blank naked parts of the axon that do not contain myelin. Those little gaps where there are no myelin, these are called nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier. So the nodes of Ranvier, this is where the voltage-gated sodium channels are. You should definitely know this point, all right? There is a high density of voltage-gated sodium channels located in the nodes of Ranvier. Okay, so this is how we're having, this is where we're having our voltage-gated sodium channels open along the length of the axon. It is at these nodes of Ranvier, all right? Sodium gets in through there, and then it's prevented from leaving due to the adjacent myelin sheaths, okay? So the nodes of Ranvier and the myelin sheath work together to make this perfect process of, of allowing depolarization and then keeping those, so, uh, those sodium ions in there until the peak of depolarization has occurred, and then we can go through repolarization, okay? So what you can uh, look at this as, well, it's like we're having a regeneration of the action potential at every node. At every node of Ranvier, we're having like a re regeneration of that signal. And this is part of the reason why we don't see an action potential decay. It does not decay with distance because at each node, we get a regeneration of that signal because of all the voltage-gated sodium channels found there. In those nodes. This is also why we call this saltatory conduction. It's a jumping, okay? We're going to see that the action potential jumps from node to node to node. You know, and again, that's, that's part of what helps this uh, signal pick up speed, all right? It says here 30 times faster, saltatory conduction. 30 times faster than what you would see in an action potential that does not have myelin, uh, in an axon that doesn't have myelin, all right? It's like it gets momentum, all right? So it's going to jump very rapidly from node to node. Here is a picture of a dendrite, okay? This is a little dendrite blown up. Now look, dendrites are not myelinated, remember? Yet we're having uh, signals come in through the dendrites. And it, remember, these are graded potentials. If we get enough of them that add up in the soma, then we get uh, an action potential at the axon hillock, which takes off and doesn't stop until it reaches the synapses. So anyway, what are we seeing? Close-up of a dendrite, no myelin. Look, we have a stimulus. Okay, some electrical signal has, has been applied here. But it decays. Okay, because there's no myelin, it's going to decay. Now, here is an axon that is not myelinated. Conduction is going to be slower. We call this continuous conduction. Now, the reason it's slower is because there's no myelin. <laughs> All right. So let's say we have our sodium channels here. Sodium's coming in. Okay, sodium's coming in. Okay, but remember, there's no myelin here. So we will, in certain parts of this axon, have some leakage go on here of these ions back out. And it will be regenerated at the next uh, uh, voltage-gated sodium channel. But it's not a strong, it's not going to be a real strong stimulus, and it's not going to go very fast. 
because we don't have myelin here that, that's helping to store or keep in the, those ions and prevent those ions from leaving. If we don't have myelin, we don't have nodes of Ranvier either. Um, this is just another uh, illustration of continuous conduction down an unmyelinated axon. And it's just going to be slower, okay? It says here, action potential and progress is in red. Refractory part is behind it in yellow. Excitable membrane is in green, all right? It's, it's just going to go slower. Now, here is uh, what we're dealing with a lot of the time. We're dealing with an axon that is surrounded by myelin. Here's your myelin sheath. You've got your nodes of Ron VA. Okay, notice how it's illustrating to you that these are voltage-gated sodium channels here, and they are existing in the node of Ron VA, but not in the myelin sheath. Okay, so again, you're going to have the jumping of the signal from node to node to node, and it is going to provide for a much faster action potential. And here's just another way of looking at it, right? At this node here, we're seeing all these, all the sodium is able to come in here through this node of Ron VA. And that perpetuates the signal in conjunction with the fact that we have myelin here preventing any of that sodium from leaving. And again, the signal is just going to jump from node to node to node. Um, here's another way of looking at it when we have this saltatory conduction of a myelinated axon. All right. And again, it's just going to uh, jump. Uh, wow, this is the last slide already. <laughs> Well, um, I think I already mentioned, you know, why do we care about the action potential? Well, a lot of drugs <coughs> are uh, targeted at manipulating uh, channels involved with the action potential. Uh, I did mention uh, cocaine, but also local anesthetics, with co which cocaine used to be a local anesthetic, but still the ones that are used today actually have a very similar mechanism of action. And they're going to act by blocking parts of the voltage-gated sodium channel. And they're going to work uh, th basically in neurons that um, are associated with pain responses, right? <clears throat> so if you block uh, sodium channels, voltage-gated sodium channels in neurons that signal pain, well, that's going to block the pain response, okay? So this is how local anesthetics work. All right, um, yeah, that's it. That's it for the action potential. It's a lot. There's a lot of little tedious details with it. Um, but again, I did let you know what you should focus on. So um, if you have any questions about it, uh, let me know. And uh, best of luck. Thanks, guys.